to evaluate the performance of any barrier so, like, or audible? any road safety hardware before actual crash testing at Natrax. So what I have done is to understand to understand the performance. Hello. I have to do ah, uh, simulation. Am I audible? This yeah, is how it started. Okay. So fine. European test standard EN 1370 uh, says that every barrier has to achieve two goals. Number one, it has to be flexible enough, flexible enough to protect occupants of a passenger car in fact. This is located on the left. This is a 900 kilogram car, 820 plus with the uh, ballast or uh, dummy, 900 kilogram car, hitting to this barrier and feeling a lot of accelerations. This acceleration actually means a risk for the occupants, injury risk. If it is too high, it may cause some damage, some uh, injury to the occupants. But our engineering should, uh, should work in a way that it should not create a big accelerations, thus the survivable uh, crash. Meantime, the same barrier has to have a strong, structurally adequate to contain this truck. So number one goal is has to be flexible enough to protect the occupants. Number two, it has to be strong enough to contain and redirect a big vehicle. This could be a truck. This could be a bus. This could be a track. This what EN 1317 standard says. So the best way to understand whether this barrier works or not is to run a simulation. That was the intention of the Federal Highway Administration when they introduced in 1990s the simulation. They said, of course, we have talented engineers. They can design beautiful barriers. However, on foreseen mistakes could cause some type, some uh, damages and also waste of money, time and test failures. So we would like to prevent that, those. So what we do is run the simulation before any uh, decision making and full scale crash testing. Actually, uh, this was the performance and then likewise, the truck also hit the barrier and damaged the barrier, however, the damage on the vehicle and the barrier uh, was successful in containing and redirecting the vehicle. That's what we do actually for simulations. Likewise, another common barrier in India is a tri-beam barrier. This is also uh, sometimes 1800, sometimes 2000, sometimes 2100 millimeter long, tall uh, post. Three millimeter thick tri beam and five millimeter thick post and spacer. This is the design usually used in India currently. So, in simulation, we have to model the barrier first, as in the drawings, and then we will simulate the impact. Now it's a tri barrier, stronger than W beam, and it's the next level actually. Previously, we tested with a truck. 10,000 kilogram truck that was an H1 barrier. So I want to, I don't want to confuse you, but keep it as simple as W beam barrier is an H1 level barrier for European norm. And this is a tri beam barrier represents H2, one, one level up, H2 level barrier. And this one requires a bus impact. This bus weighs 13 tons and the impact angle is 20 degrees, and the speed is 70 kilometers per hour as defined in EN 1317. So what happened was, I hope that the simulation would predict the barrier performance accurately, and the bus is contained, and the test, hopefully the crash test will be successful. So this simulation provides us um, confidence before going into further testing. 
Of course, we have many limitations at the moment with simulation work. Otherwise, we would not talk about crash testing. If this was a perfect uh, representation of the crash testing, then we, we would not talk about crash testing. We would only say, all right, let's do the simulation and get it certified. That doesn't work that way. Soil properties, because these posts can be installed on a asphalt, like shown in the picture, or a soil which properties can vary significantly. It could be a, a rigid soil, it could be a weak soil, or it could be a moderate uh, soil in between. We don't know the properties. As long as we are not sure, the barrier performance may alter. So the soil properties and post-soil interaction is an important parameter. Concrete matter material failure, if exists, is a big question for the simulation. Underestimation of working with, which is a measure of performance and act acceleration severity index, also a measurement taken from the crash test, would depend on the crash test results, depending upon the accuracy of the models. And vehicle models also play a big role in the outcome of any simulation. So this is actually a, a research project. They tested the actual concrete, impacted this uh, steel uh, rail on top and observed the damage on the concrete and they tried to model it. And the model contains everything that exists in the, in the, uh, the barrier, concrete and steel barrier. However, the, the, the damage pattern is not 100% matching and they're still working on it. So simulation, in summary, it has been, has been evolving for the past 20 years and 30 years. Models are getting better and better, more accurate every day. The details of the vehicle models, connection models, steel properties, and post-soil interactions, a lot of things are improving. And once these are better, the simulation result would be more accurate. So the simulation is an excellent tool to provide confidence to barrier designers and companies. So without the simulation, it's, a, it's an unknown barrier. The performance cannot be uh, uh, predicted beforehand. Once we have the simulation, we can make a decision on how to use, how much to use, the thickness of the post, the, the embedment of the post, the spacing and the material properties and so forth. So once we predict the results with our accurate models, with accurate simulations, we feel confident and we have an accurate prediction because if the circular by, uh, presented by the Indian government says a tri-beam should be such and such performance level, for example, a, a W4 working with, then we know in advance that reaching W4 target is within, within our, uh, you know, uh, a possibility based on the simulation. And of course, simulation would save a lot of time, repeat of failed test and cost, and uh, you can develop, all the companies, all the manufacturers can develop more products uh, with, with expected time. So I wanna compare how numerical simulations and crash testing are related actually in this slide. In standard crash testing, we design a barrier, like I showed you a steel barrier in India, a W beam, we send it to Natrax for crash testing, and then it's certified. They say it achieved such and such performance level, congratulations, your barrier passed the crash test. However, if you have any concerns or any type of questions about the design's adequacy, whether it will pass or not, once what we do is basically 
we take the barrier design and model it. We put it on this Alastina simulation. And first we create a finite element model of the barrier. Next, we run a virtual crash testing, which is called pre-evaluation and see how it works, whether it passes, whether it reaches W4 or a failure or some other performance. Then we send it to crash testing and we say, okay, you can take this barrier, now manufacture it, send it to Natrex for crash testing. Now this would, this would provide us an advantage. Now, once we match the results of the finite element simulation with crash testing, now we have a valuable information in our hands, which is an accurate finite element model of the barrier. At this moment, at this moment, it's validated. Your, your finite element model is validated. Tell me what can we do with this validated model? We can do a lot of things. For example, for example, what happened in my experience? So let's say the material properties of a W beam changed. You, India no longer manufactures E250, but now they have E350. So do we have to run another crash test? Because now it's a different product. Another example, let's say, let's say the thickness of the post changed from five to 4.8. Do we have to run another crash testing at Natrax? Well, the answer is maybe. Depending upon the modification, which I will talk about now, we can, we can get away sometimes with only simulation, with a test report modification, or limited full-scale crash testing. These are called, these are called A, B, and C type barrier modifications. So finite element simulations play a big role also here to save a lot of money on modified products because eventually in India, you may use that product, not a problem. But once you have a tender, for example, in Malaysia, in, in for example, South Africa or in Saudi Arabia, in, it tend, it, that tender may say that we are using such and such steel quality, not yours, not E250. We are using, as in Europe, S which is still 235 JR. Well, pretty much, pretty much 250 and 235, the yield and the ultimate strengths are similar. However, it's a different type of material. What are you gonna do? In EN1317 and Annex A of section five, it explains details of finite element simulations. It says, Modifications which are not considered to affect performances of vehicle restraint systems, VRS. As I explained, in Europe, the barriers or guardrails or uh, road ride restraint systems, VRS, vehicle restraint systems. In, in the US, it is safety hardware. If it is A type, then you don't have to do much, just a, a letter to explain to the consultant that this is a type modification, we just change a bolt or we just painted the barrier, nothing much. Moderate type, B type, modifications to one or more components where their effects on the performance of RS can be determined by some testing. As an, as an example, you change the thickness, seal properties, the, the length of the post, Hmm, like there's a question. It may change the behavior or may not. I don't know. This is where you can use finite element simulations. And number C, uh, the, the C is a significant change. Post spacing, for example. Or a, a larger type of modification, changing some type of uh, cross-section on the post. 
this is a big modification. So here is a small modification, type B. You change the length of the post. It's everything else is the same. This, the cross section of the post, the W beam, exact, exact replica. The only difference, the left crash tested with 1400 millimeter. Now, standard changed, standard changed, and they're asking a minimum of 1700 millimeter. This is actually happened in Turkey. We tested with 1400, it passed, not a problem, crash test. Now the Turkish government changed the regulation and they said, oh no, that was in the past, now I want 1700 millimeter post length minimum. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna go test again? Well, depending upon the modification as I explained, this is a B type modification and the performance of the barrier is actually increased. It become improved with the lo longer post. And I may I run a simulation for the company and showed that the length of the post, because it is underground, not above ground, nothing changed. The performance did not change, but I had to show this with a simulation. Another problem, you have a soil inserted steel post with a tri-beam, no spacer so the company tested the one on the left with a success it performed perfectly the barrier passed the crash test and one customer in europe says that look you tested this barrier on a crash test sent lab not trucks with a very strong ground but in my area i am installing this in mountains, the soil, the topsoil, 20 centimeters of top topsoil is weak now. Tell me if these two cases have any difference. Do they have any difference? That's a good question again. Now, it's a B-type modification. We didn't change the barrier. We didn't change much. We just changed a little bit of soil on top. It's still the same soil but the first 20 centimeters is a questionable. So another simulation and another report has to be prepared without further crash testing. So simulations save a lot of time and money once you have a validated model. So this one basically explains that uh, the modification A, B, or C, how it is found. So let me go with um, one of them is change to physical design. Do we change the physical design? If we say yes, all right. Is change to energy absorption method, impact characteristics change? If you say no, you just run a simulation and you write a technical report and it's acceptable. But if you say yes, the energy absorption even changed significantly, something, you know, we change, then computational model, do you have a computational model? Yes. Then it's a category B, you can do a simulation and give a result. No, you have a significant change because you didn't run a crash test on this. Then you have to have a category C. Category C means that you have to run a simulation and then you have to run a partial crash test. If you change the post, you will change, you will run another um, crash test with a truck or a bus. If you change something, you run with a small car, depending upon the situation. So this is a flow chart of how modifications are decided. We have many challenges, and this is good for researchers, which keep us you know, awake during night. How can I figure out the tearing, rupture, concrete fracture? Every night when I go to bed, I think about this, all right, there is an issue with the concrete barrier test, which I could not predict accurately. What was the problem? All right, the concrete or the steel reinforcement or the soil, post-soil interaction or vehicle modeling, something. Material properties, right? I have to think about this. This is a good opportunity for my students to, to uh, have a master's thesis, a PhD thesis, 
sent some uh, proposals to the government to get some money for research. So this is good for me and, and for the researchers and for simulations. The better, the more research, the better results and better uh, outcome. So issues that we still have to address, vehicle stability problems, or occupant compartment uh, deformation problems, which we need to more accurately model. Windshield, well, for example, at the models at the moment, we're not concentrating on the windshield damage, which should be incorporated into the models, and the damage on the axle. So, for example, we're not modeling this accurately. It has to detach. In this crash test, the barrier was so strong, it just pull apart. We have to model this. And this is a crash test. I'm not sure if you're able to see it. In this crash test, the front axis broke of this truck. Now, the question is whether I could accurately simulate this failure. The answer is no, not at the moment. I was not expecting this. However, maybe in six months, yes, I need to do some modifications in my model, vehicle model, so that it will predict such failures, which is likely because I have a crash test now to validate my models to make it more accurate. So every day I put something on it to make it more and more. So you see the fracture of uh, the wheel assembly is very likely in crash tests. They separate and then the performance of the vehicle changes with that because it's, not, it's no longer on four wheels anymore. Once you have a failed uh, wheel, the trajectory of the vehicle changes, which I need to know beforehand. To do this, I need to spend more time on vehicle modeling. You see, if there's a failure in the, in the tires or the wheel, would change a lot of things in the simulation. Or you have a rupture in the rail, which is a devastating result. Now, I don't know the reason. Could it be a, a flaw in the material right at that point where the vehicle hits an unfortunate situation or some type of uh, problem with the, the torque, the tightness of the bolts or some other issue I need to find out. But the simulation should give me this outcome and warn me beforehand, before I spend a lot of money, time, and this disappointing result. And there are much more. There are localized snagging and the vehicle performances, lots of things that need to be modeled. So as I explained, a valid model is a key to achieve success. Without a valid model, you're just dreaming. You're just expecting something that doesn't happen in a crash test. So physical event of interest within a tolerance, if I can predict that, then my model could be considered accurate and validated. So my model should capture everything that is likely to happen in a crash test and qualitative and quantitative comparisons, meaning visuals, visuals, and some numbers should be, should be matching. All right, let me show you, and I'm about to finish my presentation. This is the top three videos are an actual crash test, and the lower three are the simulations of it. Qualitative and quantitative comparisons would validate a, a model. So here, I could validate the, the, the vehicle as well as the barrier models. And the signal, this is a quantitative way of seeing the numbers, how much they match, whether I'm within the tolerances or I'm off. This is an American crash test, very recent, because it's a mash test. Clearly, the truck is a 2270 pickup. Oop. 
This is the crash test and the simulation. The closer we are with the crash test, the better we are for the future. And I think the model of the truck and the barrier looks, looks pretty good. So let me go quickly. What is a verification? Process of determining that a model implementation accurately represents the description of the model and the solution of the model. So basically a way of um, accurately representing. Software and numerical error estimation should be included in the verification. And what is validation? So two things, validation and verification. The process of determining the degree of which a model is an accurate representation of the real world from the perspective of intended model application. This is critical for us. Usually, usually validation is a key for the future, for the further studies. Department of Defense use this. Uh, most of the engineering uh, committees use this. Um, uh, NASA uses this. Most of the industry uses VNV, validation and uh, verification activities. This is an important thing for us too. All right, where do you want, want to be with the simulation? Short time, in few years. Um, we would like to continue uh, improving our models with a level of tolerance. We would like to find perfect models for vehicles, for crash testing, for, for a country, for example, an iShare truck or another truck if we're using in India or an I-10 or a Kia or whatever we are using, we would like to have an accurate model with tolerances in near future so that the predicted crash test result would be fine. However, in the long term, we have to eliminate full-scale crash testing completely, if possible, on a long term. And I don't know how long this is going to be, but that is the main target of the simulation uh, industry. We have to have improvements in the vehicle models the tires, the suspension, the windshield damage, the vehicle properties, and also post-soil interaction and fracture modeling in the materials. I want to finish with two full-scale crash tests. My presentation ends with these two. The first test, I think you're familiar with this barrier. I showed you before. This crash test is performed in Australia Professor, one professor in University of uh, New South Wales, a well-known professor, uh, performed this crash test in, um, in Australia. Now, this is an SUV. And we never test barriers with SUV. In European standard, as I showed you, a passenger car, truck, bus, tractor, trailer, never SUVs. This barrier is a standard tri-beam, India uses. Actually, this is an 850 millimeter high test. I'm going to show you the crash test in a while. Now, this is a tri beam. And this one, same SUV, a second SUV, tested with 850, 850 millimeter height for cable barrier does not exist in India. So, you can compare the performance of this cable barrier system with your existing system. Here is the crash test of tri-beam with SUV. As far as I see, this is a, a big uh, failure with toppled vehicle and uh, rolls, many rolls, and the barrier did not perform as intended. So this is a dangerous barrier uh, with its current situation for SUVs. Then if we have more tests with vehicles, with trucks, with bus, with other vehicles, we will understand the, the performance of this barrier in general whether it's used, can be used on highways with, uh, with uh, safe, safely, or we cannot use it because of it is uh, 
concerns. Now, if we go to cable barrier crash test, So the results are totally different. Now, the cable barrier performed perfectly, contained the barrier, contained the vehicle, and redirected the vehicle, and the result was uh, satisfying in terms of SUV. So now we have to decide how we should proceed. Now, if we run a simulation before we run a full-scale crash test, we should be able to see that SUV test contains risks for a tri-beam barrier currently used in India. Well, as well as we can try, we can try with a small passenger car or a truck or a bus to see the outcome. At what conditions this tri-beam barrier can be used, actually? Can we do some modifications if we insist using this? Or should we change the design to make it crash-worthy, better, for all the vehicles in India, or most of the vehicles in India, within the uh, crash test standards. So with that, I want to leave you my final remarks that computational mechanics is currently fully integrated into the development of crashworthy roadside hardware designs as of 2021. The accuracy of vehicle and barrier models are significantly improved. Number of design test iterations, time spent, and the cost is minimized with finite element simulations. With the new technology on hardwares, computers, and softwares is making it easier to reach the, our target. And crash test data, we need more crash test data. At Natrax is testing now for about a year and a half because I was there in uh, February 2020. It's been uh, 18 months and maybe more that they are gathering a lot of information. And Mr. Sagar Bendra probably provide us some information about uh, Natrak's achievements, which I, uh, I uh, witnessed myself that it's doing a fantastic job and for India, and I am uh, supporting this uh, fully. Now, final question is what I asked in the beginning. Could full-scale numerical crash test simulations replace real crash testing? The answer is not anytime soon. And this is good news for the crash test labs. They have to test more for our sake, for uh, improvement of our simulation and models. Did we have any success with the finite element simulations in the, in the past 30 years? Not a doubt. Absolutely, it was fantastic. What finite element could do to predict the outcome of full-scale crash testing Amazing. And there are a lot of things that we need to do still because modifications, the future potential of in India currently just barriers are being tested. Mike Dresnes will probably touch many things for the past 50 years of his experience, many things that has been tested in the US, Europe, and other countries. Uh, what can be done to further test? Because as Dr. Karup Karupia in the beginning mentioned, all the hardware, all the material, all the structures that are used on highways for safety should be tested. You cannot just place a barrier or a post or something on the barrier haphazardly just to expect that it would work. It's not going to work. Sometimes that the result would be even worse by using it. So did we have success? Yes. And the final question, what is the relationship between full-scale crash testing and numerical simulation? How close they are? I consider them best friends because friends would uh, um, uh, complement their friends and uh, with hand-by-hand -hand simulation and crash testing would make world a safer place for traffic safety. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you have any questions at the end, I am willing to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ali. We'll be taking up the questions at the end of the session, as already indicated earlier. Your presentation was indeed
very exciting and we did come to know that numerical simulation is going to help us but not to the extent of physical testing thank you so much for sharing your views thank you our my pleasure next speaker